أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أضم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابي عباد الله الحسين عليه السلام Dear respected brothers and sisters, viewers from around the world Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Our condolences to you all on behalf of Ahlul Bayt TV on the martyrdom of Abad Al Hussein alayhi salam. Every year we gather from all corners of the world to commemorate this individual who lived his life by the way of Allah. Himself, his family and of course his holy companions were all martyred on these days many years ago. During these 10 nights inshallah I will be joined by a great friend teacher and scholar, Father Christopher Klehesi. Hi Father, welcome to the show. Thank you, nice to be here. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Um, and brothers and sisters, what we are looking to do during this series, inshallah, is analyze the historical, philosophical and spiritual events that took place, not just in the Battle of Karbala, but also in the moments surrounding it, and analyze individuals and moments that took place of course, across these 10 nights as well. Father Chris, thank you again for spending your time with us. Um, just to kind of introduce, there's so much, a wealth of information to digest when talking about uh, Karbala and all the events surrounding it. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, for those who perhaps uh, don't know you, and I'm sure a lot of us do, um, but um, for those who don't know you, uh, a bit about your, your background, your, any recent works you've done perhaps. So yes, I'm a, I'm a South African, uh, born and bred there and grew up in the city of Cape Town. I did my uh, Arabic and Islamic studies starting in Cairo and then continuing in Italy. Um, I then decided to specialize in Shi'i Islam uh, uh, upon the advice of uh, my teacher, Michael Fitzgerald, who, who lives up in Liverpool and who was a, a truly great Arabist. So I decided to produce a work on Lady Fatima, maybe the first maybe the first academic work in English based on the Arabic sources, which I think I did now. There are plenty of new works about her, but mine was, I think, the first. Um, uh, that was my doctoral program, Lady Fatima. Then I produced a, a work on Lady Zainab um, because we, we thought in my college, which is in Rome, and it's the college, the Pontifical College for Arabic Islamic Studies, we thought, well, we start we should write about more of the woman of Islam. And sure. uh, having, having obviously come across Lady Zainab in the life of Lady Fatima, I wrote a book on Lady Zainab, which was popularly received. And I've just published a third work because while I was working on Lady Zainab, I came across some of the very interesting dreams that predicted the death of al Hussein and the dreams that announced his death and then the dreams that predicted the punishment of those who killed him. So three sets of dreams. And I kept putting these in a folder somewhere in a drawer saying I must work on these. So yeah. now I've produced a little work called Angels Hastening, which is about the role that Jibril plays in all of this and also the role of these dreams to a variety of people, good and bad, sure. concerning al Hussein. So that's been my pet project until, until the beginning of this year. Yeah. So the, the name of the most recent book, Angels Hastening. Why hastening? It comes from a, an English translation of a Quranic verse. Uh, I can't remember surat, which surat it is. It's a translation by Pictal, who was uh, the first real English translator, modern English translator. And it is a verse in which he translates, which he translates as angels hastening. And this is defined as the angels perhaps who hurry before the prophets to prepare the way for the message. Um, but in the book, uh, there are a number of uh, hadith texts of Jibril moving quite rapidly between heaven and earth, trying to convince the prophet of this grandson who is going to be killed, and the prophet receiving this quite reluctantly, and Lady Fatima too, and there's, a, there's a, an anxiety in, in Jibril to get this message preached. So there's a, a number of Arabic, Arabic verbs are used which, which literally mean he thrust himself up from earth into heaven and then roared down again like a speeding car, and finally... And finally, so, so I picked up this sense of movement also in moments when Jibril shows the land of Karbala to um, Al Hussein or to Muhammad to the Prophet by beating his wing on the ground sure. or extending his wing. There's a sense of movement. So I, I decided to use that idea of angels in a hurry to get a message across. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Father Christopher, when we talk about the incident of Karbala, the life of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, Perhaps today the, the interpretation of Karbala is differed amongst different corners of society, especially within different schools of thought. 
Some may see the Battle of Karbala as merely a political dispute or some sort of unfortunate killing which took place. Others, of course, uh, subscribe to the opinion that the life and the death of Imam Hussein was a monumental moment in history. It was a time uh, and, and uh, an event which shook the world and shaped all narratives to come. Uh, of course, we subscribe to that opinion. We both have that belief that it was such a grand event. Um, why, in your experienced words, why would you agree and, and how would you reason with the, with, with the opinion that it is such an important event to take note of? Okay, so, so maybe let me preface this perhaps by a, a little reminder because it's quite important that people understand that I'm speaking um, as, a, as a Catholic historian and a Catholic theologian. You don't need me to teach Shia Islam to you. Uh, in Shia Islam, I'm just a, a learner, I'm a beginner, really. Whereas people who live it every day, they have a far more profound grasp of it. So when I speak to you, I'm speaking as somebody outside of the tradition who is offering a fresh vision, perhaps through a non-Muslim lens. And, and one of the things that I try to do is read quite broadly texts which would be approved by the Shia community and even texts which they may reject or may not be happy with, such as some of the Makatil literature. But when I read Catholic theology, I also read Protestant theology. So I think for me as an historian, that broad reading is, is quite important and then attempt to offer a, a particular vision of the principles of Shi'a Islam or the practices, more important for me, the personalities. Mm -hmm. And people who know me, people who've heard me or read my work know that I have a profound respect for the Ahl Bayt, that I speak from a place of respect and reverence. I wrote a book about Lady Zainab because I knew that I could learn something from her. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered to write. I could write about anybody else. So it's important for me to clarify that because, you know, people don't have to necessarily agree with my interpretation. Um, mine is a particular vision from a, from a different point of view, right. and it's, it's a possible interpretation. So in terms of, in terms of Karbala, um, there are two elements which are of interest to me. The first is the element of sheer disbelief that the Ummah of the Prophet could kill his grandson. Mm -hmm. That is an extraordinary factor, and it's a factor that should make our faces flush, that some of the people involved in his death were children of companions. You know, Muawiyah's father, for example, now he wasn't directly involved, but he was a catalyst for that event. His father had been a companion of the Prophet. And you wonder in two generations, how did you get so far from, from the truth? So there's, first of all, the element of shock, which I think is, needs to be kept alive, that, that this was a, a profoundly bad moment. It wasn't just a mistake. It wasn't just a blip. It was a profoundly disastrous moment in one sense for the, the unity of the of the of the Ummah, of the community. But on the other hand, you have a second element, and that is this consistent theme that runs through Shia Islam of standing for what is right. Sure. And the standing for what is right is not just aimed at, you know, at economics or at politics or at the ethics of daily life, at the way people trade and buy. It's also directed at the leader of the House of Islam. And this is, a, is an idea that has been present and, and, and was present right up to 1979, that the leader of the House of Islam needs to be a person who can practice Islam because he understands the, 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 true, the truthful principles of Islam. And therefore, the stand of Al-Hussein might be seen by some Western historians as just another political grab for power. He was angry because, because Yazid had the power, because Muawiyah had betrayed Has Al-Hassan and had not kept to the promises he'd made. Al-Hussein was now getting his political revenge. That's a very minimalistic way. Sure of reading, and it denigrates the person of Al-Hussein, it denigrates the richness of his character, that this wasn't a political grab for power. Surely, as, as Al-Hussein marched towards Karbala with his tiny group of companions, he knew that this was not going to be a political grab for power. And, and you know, the fact that, that he was offered the opportunity to turn back meant that the, the other opposing army knew that this wasn't just a political grab for power. If it had been just that, then the whole of Karbala is a defeat. As it stands, Karbala is merely a military defeat, but it's not a spiritual defeat. Sure. It's not a theological defeat because it wasn't a political grab for power. It was a determined, Quranically based stance for truth. Hussein himself quotes Quranic texts and says, how can I do anything else? 
How can I possibly, when the house of Islam is being led by somebody who is patently unethical and un-Islamic in his principles, how can, I, how can I step aside? It's interesting that this was before the real firm development of Islamic Shia Islamic principles. So the principle of defending what is good, enjoining what is good, and pre preventing what is evil, that was not yet firmly established. That came later as a theological, but he was already acting on that. Mm -hmm. that, that in a sense, he was a prefigurement, um, yeah, a prefigurement of a theological principle that was there in essence, but not yet in, in, in its full potential. But he was already living that, as was Lady Zainab. So we, we, we have to find the middle path. I think that Karbala was everything you said. It was certainly a political act, but it was something else as well. It was a whole lot of things, and that's what makes it unique. It wasn't like the Battle of Britain or the Battle of Waterloo, which may have been highly nationalistic. People were determined to win, but this was something else. This was, this was a battle for, for the, the rights of God too. So, when, I mean, a lot of the time nowadays we, we use... A lot of the same words to describe uh, describe Karbala and uh, the life of him and the message of Muhammad Hussein, timeless, visionary, revolutionary, things like that. Um, in what sense is the 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 story behind Karbala and and the incentive that Imam Hussein had? In what sense is that today applicable? Uh, and what lessons can the ordinary person who is not masum, who is not infallible, take away from the the actions of of an infallible? Okay, so let's have a little look at the Greek language because the answer lies in a Greek word. So, so what you do in Muharram, for example, yeah. is a twofold thing. You, you mourn and you grieve, and we'll say a few words about that because I think that is absolutely crucial. Yeah. And those who denigrate that as useless have failed to understand the truth of grief and mourning. But you also learn by your recitations of the stories of Al Hussein and of, of Karbala. So, so you're doing two things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to put those two things into one word, just say remembrance. Sure. Our remembrance is a twofold remembrance. It's a learning remembrance and it's a, a grief, grief stricken remembrance. Now, but it's not ordinary remembrance. It's not me remembering the dinner I had at your house and how nice it was. That's a different type of remembrance. Now, this is a particular remembrance, and the Greeks had a word for this, and it was anamnesis. And anamnesis means a remembrance that makes the event present again. Sure. Now, this is, this is a different thing. Yeah. You know, so when, when, a, when a person, when you grieve for al Hussein, when you mourn for his death, when you take action for justice on his behalf, and when you wish that you could have been there with him, your remembrance is not just a longing or a yearning, it is an anamnetic remembrance. In other words, you are making Karbala present and saying, I am doing this act of justice as though I were at Karbala, because at Karbala I would have stood for justice mm -hmm. as well. Now, now, this is quite important because, important because there are Plenty of things that we remember, even in our spirituality, we remember famous people. I remember Umm Salama, for example. I remember Lady Zainab, and I think, wow, these were great people. But that's not an anamnetic remembrance. In, in two religious families, in Shia faith and in Catholic faith, there is a particular, let's say, liturgical action that makes a past event present. And Muharram does that. It's not just thinking back. It's actually being present at Karbala, and that's how it's timeless. It's timeless not, not because it happened in history and it was important. It's timeless because Karbala has become a, a space which people still inhabit and still live daily. In little ways, maybe, but sometimes in big ways. Most of us, in little ways, because most of us don't play a major role on the world stage, sure. but we do play a major role in our own world, family world, business world, ethical world. And, and therefore, in a sense, all of us are inhabiting this space called Karbala, and that's what makes it timeless. Mm. I think I, I used a phrase in the book on Zainab that Karbala is like God's pencil. God is an artist who sketches this space and invites people to live their lives in that space. It's a place of discomfort, but the places of discomfort are the best places to live. You don't want to live in a place of comfort because then you can no longer remember. Places of discomfort are the best places to serve and to be useful and to remember. So that's the timelessness. For me, that's the timelessness of karma. The, the, the two prongs of, of remembrance, which you, uh, you mentioned, educational and, and the, the grief-stricken remembrance, perhaps allows us today to refresh the reason why we commemorate the 10 days of, of Muharram and beyond year-round as well. 
uh, and maybe to to those who mourn Imam al Hussein and, and try to ap apply his lessons in a day to day life, it gives us a fresh perspective, like you're saying, um, on what we can do to, to better remember him. Um, you mentioned an interesting point about grief and why grief is, is so important, so relevant. In the world we live in today, um, with you know the globalization and at, at times the loss of cultural heritage, especially for for those from you know the Middle East or Asia or other parts of the world who then move to a new land and who are less potentially less comfortable with the concept of mourning and grieving like our, our forefathers were. Um, there is always a risk or a danger that the grief behind Karbala could be lost. Of course, traditionally it's important that you know there's so many hadith about shedding a tear for Imam Hussein and the barakah it brings to you and the blessings it has on your family as well. Why is it important for us to to, to attempt to grieve at the bare minimum? Firstly, because it is a natural human process. Human beings grieve. We grieve over those we love and whom we lose for a while until one day we will meet them again in the garden, which is the promise that we live by. We, we grieve when, when our lives experience a loss, economic or financial. Grief is a, a crucial part of human life, and it's also, and especially in Shi Islam, and I've said this often before, it's also ritualistic. Sure. And ritual is crucial. If you take ritual out of religion, you are left with a dry, legalistic list of things that God doesn't want you to do. Mm -hmm. And it would be sad if our faith was just a checklist of all the things forbidden for me. No, the faith that is revealed in the Quran is much more than a checklist. And ritual is the thing that stops our faith being dry and legalistic and gives it passion. The greatest contribution of Shia Islam to the world is its passion. That's what its contribution is. Mm -hmm. You look at, you look at um, Arba'in or look at the Muharram festivals, the Ashura festivals. It's the passion of people who, who love Hussein and his martyrdom, but through that they are, they are uh, they're empowered, but through that they are showing their obedience and their, their reverence before God yeah. by loving God's creatures. Take away the passion and you've lost everything. What have you got to offer? A, bit of, a, a few more bits of Sharia or a few more bits of, of fiqh. But what else? The passion, every human being has rituals that they use every day without knowing them. We all do the same things every day. We don't think about them because they are embedded into our lives. But if you change my ritual, my whole life is thrown off course. Sure. Take away somebody's daily timetable and they don't know what to do. It's like people suffering from jet lag. We all live by ritual, therefore ritual is crucial. But I think you forgot one prong. The prong of learning, absolutely. The prong of ritual, but there has to be action. Mm. You have to carry Karbala into action for justice because that's what it is primarily, an action for God's justice, for, for Adl. And, and we have to, I can't weep for Al Hussein and learn about his life if I'm not prepared to stand where he stands. And that's probably more important now than ever before yeah. with the yeah. injustice around the world. Yeah. And, so, and, and that's so a natural outflow of my grief and my learning is that I translate that into action, even small actions in my marriage or in my family, that I live ethically, in my business, or that I put an end, I, that I forbid people doing wrong if I can. This is all part of the, the response or the, the evolvement of grief. But take one of those three away, it's a three-legged stool, the stool will fall over. Mm. It's crazy when you think about the, maybe I shouldn't say crazy, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing when you think about all the the dozens, if not countless number of messages within just even the day of Ashura itself. We talk about the, the, the father-son relationship, the mother-son relationship, uh, and, and how we can then apply those to our own family relationships. We talk about water and heat and thirst and, and the poverty that exists around us in the world today. And these, if anything, should be stark reminders to us that applying the message of Karbala is now more important than ever. Um, Father Christopher, before we wrap up uh, the first show, um, what is the, uh, perhaps a message you would give to someone who's tuning in to Ahlul Bayt TV for a first time or maybe hearing about this story for a first time and wants to know why and how is this event, this commemoration, life-changing for me? I would say um, primary, primarily because it is, for me, one of the most classic models of somebody who is willing to die not only for what he believes, but for what he's witnessed. So I know lots of people now who would die for what they believe. Mm. 
I don't know many people who would die for what they claim to have seen. I mean, you might be convinced you saw that UFO hovering over Tower Bridge and even a green man waving to you, but would you die for that? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You might die for the faith of Islam, but for that, maybe not. In a sense, I, I, I like to think that Al Hussein had seen in his grandfather mm -hmm. what, what, was, what had to be seen, and all he was doing was modeling what his grandfather would have done, and therefore, he was willing to die not only for what he believed, but for what he had seen and maybe the generation which was killing him had not seen. Thank you so much, Father Christopher. Dearest brothers and sisters, thank you for tuning in. Inshallah, over the coming episodes, we will be looking at different elements and stories and personalities surrounding the Battle of Karbala. Thank you so much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.